See something down there? No, there's nothing there. See? How did you know? I wish I knew. Throughout history, people have been perplexed by events they couldn't explain. By dreams that seem to predict the future. By the ability to envision distant events. I have the strangest feeling. Jerry's been in a car accident. Now, come on, honey. Now, don't be silly. Let's go have some dinner, all right? Sure. Very often, those premonitions turn out to be nothing more than an overactive imagination. Hello. But there are hundreds of cases where yes. extrasensory perceptions right. have been recorded and verified. Most people feel that the only things that influence them are the things that come into the senses, the things they can taste, hear, touch, feel, or see. Well, we have evidence that there's something more than that. This thing that we call psi, which can influence people without the use of the senses. Scientists believe that psi is a means of communication that we don't yet understand. When we take in information through psi means, it is known as extrasensory perception, ESP. When we send out information without the use of our muscles, that's known as psychokinesis, or PK. But no matter whether the psi is ESP or PK, these experiences are so far from what we consider normal that it's hard to accept that these things could actually take place. What we know of ESP does not fit in with the current scientific framework. Now, we have uh, very good evidence that ESP and other psi phenomena do occur. So the obvious conclusion is that the current scientific framework is fundamentally incomplete. Now, this isn't particularly surprising. Science is always changing. Science is a dynamic process, and it really only represents the, the current best guess as to the nature of the universe. Since earliest times, man has tried to recognize and control the unseen forces around him, those he could understand and those he could not. For a long time, most of the world was heavily influenced by fortune tellers and mediums and by folklore and myth. But superstitions faded away in the 19th century. Scientists like Madame Curie began to explain away the mysteries with a new, rational way of thinking. The world embraced science. Science made industry possible, and industry produced material comforts the mediums and fortune tellers could never provide. In the bustle of the new scientific age, the Western world dismissed things like ESP as unscientific. Not until the 1930s did serious researchers, such as J.B. and Louisa Rhine, perform well-controlled experiments with ESP. Their work showed that ESP does exist. But most people still found it difficult to accept ESP as a reality. People are suspicious of ESP, because so many apparently real demonstrations turn out to be just clever trickery. And I'll write them down on the back of this. Now just think about it for a second. Do you have the two initials in your mind now? Okay. Okay, concentrate on the second initial now. Okay, I think I have it. I think I have it. 
If you'll announce your choice to the audience, then I'll reveal what I've written. SB. That's exactly what I've written here. Exactly. It looked as though I was reading her mind, but I wasn't. In fact, I wrote nothing with the pencil. Instead, after she called out the initials, I simply wrote the initials down with the pencil attached to my thumbnail, like this. The trick's as simple as that. And when supposed psychic events are not tricks, they often are just ordinary occurrences that have simple explanations. Laura, look, this is incredible. 10,000 people died in an earthquake in South America last night, and I dreamt about it. I I'm clairvoyant. I have ESP. Oh, Bob, don't you remember? You went to bed early last night. I stayed up and I watched the late news. That was on the news last night. You heard it in your sleep. You're not clairvoyant. <laughs> I guess you're right. I'm not. Yep. Verifiable psi events do take place, and scientists are now beginning to theorize about how these phenomena occur. Hey, Charlie! From what we've seen, we believe that people may be scanning their environment pretty much all of the time, scanning with psi in order to discover things out there that are related to their interest, related to their concerns. And when they discover these things, via this unconscious psi means, they react to them. It begins to influence their actions in some way. They're usually not aware of this. It's quite unconscious. It's, it's very subtle. But there's a definite influence on their behavior, it seems. Luck or coincidence may be the only factor that's involved in this type of incident. But we think there may be another factor, namely psi. Some psi research laboratories are seeking to discover under what conditions ESP can be repeated most reliably. This experiment was filmed as it actually happened at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. Ellen Messer has volunteered to be the subject in this test. Sharon Harper will try to send images to Ellen from a room down the hall. The images she sends will be from a Viewmaster slide wheel taken from a packet chosen at random. Now each packet contains four different slide reels, as you can see. And the sender will only send one of these reels. All right, I'm going to be in a room at the end of the hallway. Yeah. I'll be looking at some slides, uh -huh. which I'll try to send to you. Researchers have discovered that I most ESP experiences occur when people are very relaxed or are dreaming. Really relaxed and, and you've been uh, giving your imagery. Mm -hmm. Ping pong balls over her eyes break up the normal patterns of visual perception. A monotonous hissing through the earphones quiets her perceptions of sound. And we're going to leave and we're going to start the session, okay? These preparations serve to diminish the normal senses, making the mind more receptive to internal imagery. Where are we, Betty? Okay, Sharon. Here's the target. Have a good session. Thank you. At this point, no one knows what slides are in the packet. After ten minutes of relaxation, Sharon selects one slide wheel from the packet. some kind of um, tubular structure over my head like a, almost like an elevated subway and I'm driving in the car beneath it and I see a lot of red lights as if I was in an airplane looking down at the road and there were trees on both sides of it it looked as if it was carved from a mountain. And I was looking at it, an aerial view.
cliffs, very high, craggy cliffs, and the water is down to my left. Different bas relief pictures on the walls, of, actually on stone. The image that keeps coming back is driving down that road with the red lights and the tubular structure above my head. And it keeps returning again and again and again. Okay, fine. Okay, I'll just give you, you know, take your After time. half an hour, Ellen is brought in to look at the slide wheel packet. Okay. At this point, only Sharon knows which slide wheel was viewed during the experiment. Both in bed knobs and uh, broomsticks. And in these cathedrals of the world, there's a picture, the one with the arch. I don't know why this one seems kind of familiar. It's the, the one with the arch. But this is my first inclination. When you first came in? Yeah, when I first... It was just something about this. It's my first inclination is... Uh, Cathedrals of the of Europe. Do you want me to write that as one? Write yeah. that as one. Okay. <laughs> Bed knobs and broomsticks is two. Your woods will be three. Birds of the world will be four. I okay. guess that's my order. Okay. I guess we should get Sharon in here to um tell us what it was. Mm. Uh, hi. Hi. Why don't you tell us what it was? It was cathedral. Hey, another oh, direction. Right. Fantastic. 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 You know, she came right in here and said... There is one chance in four that Ellen could have made a lucky guess. But the group at Maimonides has repeated this procedure more than 200 times and reported direct hits in 44% of the experiments. The odds against that happening, strictly by chance, are 100 million to one. It's not only psi that remains mysterious. We really still know very little about the normal functions of mind. For example, uh, memory. Where is memory? We talk of memory banks, but we have not yet located memory in the brain. One of the world's leading neurophysiologists, uh, for example, Sir John Eccles, uh, who uh, won a Nobel Prize for his work in neurophysiology, has repeatedly warned that we should stop pretending that consciousness is not a mystery. At Stanford Research Institute, one of the goals is to determine whether psi information is transmitted via some type of radio wave or magnetic field or other means. This experiment is part of a series of remote viewing trials. Gordon Sheridan, who has volunteered for this test, chats with Dr. Russell Targ in the laboratory as Dr. Harold Puthoff receives a randomly selected target location from a senior SRI executive. Accompanied by our photographer, he leaves the institute, opens the envelope, and drives to the target location. At the laboratory, the subject tries to visualize the area Dr. Puthoff is viewing. There's a building to their left. There's some trees to their, well, very close to them. It's a dark brown building. Look around at the building. Do you see anything else in the neighborhood of that building that might be interesting? There's a, uh, some hedges between the sidewalk and the parking lot. Maybe you'd like to draw okay. what that looks like. Okay. World's worst artist. By comparing what the subjects visualize and the actual targets, SRI scientists hope to learn much more about such factors as the distance over which psi communication can function. At the time this film was produced, SRI had published results of 53 remote viewing experiments and independent judges had correctly matched targets in over half of them. We know that we have something. We know that psi is real, that it works, but we have not yet uh, discovered the mechanism underlying it. Well, we assume that when psi events occur, 
there must be corresponding events going on in the body, and particularly in the brain. And the question is whether we can learn something about those events by studying the processes that we can measure at the surface of the body. During the experiment, you'll be relaxing down in the basement in our room, which is over that way, about 150 feet. And we'll be recording your EEG. And occasionally, the computer will be turning on this light up here in this room. Get an idea what that looks like. The room will be very dark, and it'll be a good, good bright flash. And we'd like you to try and get a sense of what's happening up here. And then after each trial, you'll be asked to give your guess about what you thought was occurring, whether the light was on or off. Okay, Steve, we're all set now. Now we can take the signals from your scalp, and they'll come down the wire, down into the board, out into the polygraph, and up to our computer. Okay? All set. Every 20 seconds or so, the computer upstairs decides to either flash the strobe light or not to flash it. Downstairs, Steve's job is to visualize what's happening with the strobe and indicate his guess by pressing the button. But what we're really interested in is seeing whether even even in the event that he himself doesn't consciously know what's happening, maybe his brain in some sense does. So that's what the experiment is all about. We've, we've run five sessions of an experiment like this. And we do have some preliminary evidence that when the light comes on, changes occur in the EEG that are like the changes you would see if the light were flashed right at the subject, that is, in his physical presence. The work at Duke is significant for two reasons. First, it is helping to explain some of the basic mechanisms involved in psi. But even more important, the work has attracted researchers from a variety of disciplines. They recognize that psi represents a totally new frontier in the science. These scientists and their colleagues throughout the world have come to believe that if the fundamental workings of psi can be understood and controlled, then it may be possible, for perhaps the first time in the history of mankind, to vastly expand the horizons and boundaries of the mind.